Although a Star Wars fan, I was introduced to the Clone Wars TV series rather late. I was somehow oblivious to Tartakovsky's show when it came on in 2003, and when Filoni's show started in 2008, I was starting my senior year in high school and had put my cartoon-watching days behind me. Since then, I've been told all the wonderful things I missed and how much I need to see these series as they greatly improve the prequel trilogy. As this was a worthy cause, over the past couple years, I've caught up with all the Star Wars animated series, including Filoni's Star Wars Rebels. One element I was repeatedly told to look forward to was the character Ahsoka Tano. According to several online polls, Ahsoka Tano is one of the most popular Star Wars characters of all time, and my friends certainly hold true to this claim. They constantly sing her praise, so I paid her special attention when watching, and I must say, I was nothing but disappointed. Her character is mediocre at best, filled with cliched writing and a severe lack of depth. Yet when I expressed my disinterest in the character to my friends, I was immediately and unanimously criticized. The devotion to Ahsoka is obviously strong, so she and her fans deserve a better critique than just, I don't really like her. I'm not trying to turn Ahsoka's fan base against her. There's nothing wrong with liking Ahsoka. Liking characters is a subjective thing. Yet there are objective flaws in Ahsoka's character. Again, if they don't bother you, that's fine. I'm not trying to convert you so much as vindicate myself. I'm also a huge fan of storytelling and the art of storytelling, so I like to point out when it's done well and when it's not. Yet no true criticism is complete without presenting a solution. So, by the end of this video, I'll present potential fixes for Ahsoka's character which I think would make her more enjoyable. These fixes will be based on other Dave Filoni characters in order to keep Ahsoka true to her original design. For this analysis, I'll be discussing spoilers from both Clone Wars TV series, the Clone Wars movie, Rebels, the original trilogy, and the prequel trilogy. If you're watching this, I imagine you're probably up to date on everything. But if someone's way behind like I was, or just doesn't have Disney+, Plus, you've been warned. Now, I won't be discussing or considering the book Star Wars Ahsoka by E.K. Johnston, or any other books or comics which may relate to the character, for the simple reason that I haven't read them. I don't believe this in any way limits or invalidates my critique of Ahsoka's character, because each medium is supposed to stand on its own. Additional materials should expand and elaborate the story. The story shouldn't be incomplete without additional material. That's just basic storytelling. Look no further than my current dilemma as an example. I simply have no interest in reading Johnston's book because Filoni's show didn't make me like Ahsoka. If I did like her, then I'd want to know more. You have to draw the audience in first. Additional material is meant to expand, not to be a crutch to the source material. I'd also like to note that I'm looking at Ahsoka as she appears in The Clone Wars, not so much as in Rebels. Her flaws featured in The Clone Wars don't appear as drastically in Rebels, but I'll talk about that at the end of this analysis. But enough preamble. Let's get to the topic. Ahsoka Tano was introduced in the film Star Wars The Clone Wars in August of 2008, and continued on as one of the main cast in the TV series of the same name debuting in October of the same year. When introduced, she's a 14-year-old Jedi assigned to be Anakin Skywalker's Padawan learner. It seems very obvious to me that she was introduced to appeal to a younger audience, and this automatically puts her in my bad graces, as I'm not a fan of characters specifically designed to pander to a particular demographic. Suddenly, that character becomes the kid's character, or whatever. The best example of this frustrating trope is Robin in the Batman franchise. Maybe you like Robin, but I never have. He was introduced both so Batman could narrate his thoughts more naturally and to appeal to a younger audience. Yet I find all renditions of his character annoying and problematic as they bring into question why Batman would allow a child to go crime-fighting with him. But the iteration of the character which hit closest to home was Tim Drake as Robin in The New Batman Adventures from 1997 to 99. 
I grew up with Batman the Animated Series, and this show was a sequel to that. As a kid, Dick Grayson's character annoyed me, yet I was too young to realize he didn't need to be in the story. When the new Batman adventures came along, the six-year-old me was introduced to Tim Drake, and I realized that characters could come and go. Tim Drake was 13 when he became Robin in the show, and even as a child, I found it rather ridiculous that this skinny teenager could knock down a full-grown and muscle-bound thug with a single kick. I mean, look at him. He's tiny. Yes, I understand how martial arts work, but I also know that weight divisions exist for a reason. Besides, there are other reasons 13-year-olds aren't admitted into the police force or the military, regardless of how skilled they may be. Forget the physical aspect, and just think about the intellectual, emotional, and psychological aspects. And so, all my gripes with Tim Drake can be transferred to Ahsoka Tano. Sure, Ahsoka's a Jedi. I can, therefore, overlook her age's physical shortcomings and say that she's using the Force to augment her abilities. That's how she's able to keep up with well-trained adults. Yet I'm still forced to question why a child is allowed to be a military commander. Either the Jedi are grossly unaware of the psychological trauma of war, or the war isn't all that bad. Of course, this is a kid's show, so they don't really look at PTSD, but that has the unfortunate side effect that I'm then forced to question how serious this war is. After all, if a child can not only survive without any psychological harm, but can actually thrive in this environment with all the pressure of being a commander on the front lines, then this war is pretty trivial. Now, I'll admit that these problems I've mentioned are problems of the genre more than problems with Ahsoka's character. It's a kid's show. Of course, kid's shows can be very deep, but they tend not to be. And they tend to have lazy writing. So, Ahsoka being a pandering character and the setting of the Clone Wars being completely unthreatening aren't really her character's fault. Yet, despite these flaws, such characters can still have good writing. So let's just say that she and I got off on the wrong foot. Had I been a child when I first watched The Clone Wars, would I feel differently about Ahsoka? I doubt it, considering how much I disliked Tim Drake as a child. Yet I'll readily admit that part of my problem may be how excited I was for Ahsoka before I saw the show. I had very high expectations for her. Had they been low, maybe she would have exceeded them. Regardless, her flaws came from her writing, not her introduction. Ahsoka has two closely linked problems. First, she's never wrong, and second, she never suffers negative consequences. Now, let me explain. Ahsoka's portrayed as a strong-willed character who does what she believes is right no matter what. This is a fine character type, yet such characters run the risk of seeming rash and arrogant. In Ahsoka's case, I find she strays more into arrogant territory than strong-willed. This is primarily because she is, even by the final season of The Clone Wars, a child. At the start, she's a 14-year-old who's had no real-world experience and who is then thrust into the middle of a galactic war. Excuse me for thinking her confidence is unfounded. Compare her to the two other Padawans prominently featured in Star Wars. Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. In The Phantom Menace, Obi-Wan is 25 and about to graduate to the rank of knight. Even still, you can see his profound respect for authority in how he treats his superiors. Though he's also thrust into a war, it is a much smaller affair, dealing only with Naboo. So he's more experienced in dealing with a lower-stakes situation, and yet is more submissive. Yes, he occasionally questioned Qui-Gon Jinn's reasoning, but when his master gives his final word, Obi-Wan respectfully obeys. Even when Qui-Gon keeps him out of the loop, Obi-Wan may make a quick quib, but he still gives his master's plan his full support. We have all the essential parts we need. I'm going back. I'm on finished business. I won't be long. Why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? It's the boy who's responsible for getting us these parts. Get this hyperdrive generator installed. Yes, Master. That shouldn't take long. Look to when Qui-Gon announces he'll train Anakin. 
he's suddenly declaring Obi-Wan ready to take the trials and become a knight. Rather than complaining about feeling abandoned or unready, Obi-Wan quickly echoes his master's sentiment. I take Anakin as my Padawan learner. An apprentice you have, Qui-Gon. Impossible to take out a second. The code forbids it. Obi-Wan is ready. I am ready to face the trials. It's not disrespect, Master, it's the truth. From your point of view. The boy is dangerous. They all sense it, why can't you? His fate is uncertain. He's not dangerous. The Council will decide Anakin's future. That should be enough for you. Now get on board. I'm... I'm sorry for my behavior, Master. It's not my place to disagree with you about the boy. And I am grateful you think I'm ready to take the trials. Although he questions in private, he publicly supports his master. Obi-Wan understands the chain of command. He understands respect. And even when he doesn't agree, he knows it's not his place to defy his master. Now, obviously, Ahsoka and Obi-Wan have different temperaments, and that's perfectly fine. Ahsoka is a teenager, after all. So this could just be a matter of maturity. For a teenager to be defiant and overconfident is not a strange thing. So let's compare her to Anakin Skywalker in the Attack of the Clones instead. Anakin is 19 during this episode, so still older than Ahsoka, but closer in age. Similarly to Ahsoka, Anakin openly defies and argues with his master. When he does, however, he's immediately scolded by those around him. Not to start an investigation. We will find out who's trying to kill you, Padme. I promise you. We will not exceed our mandate, my young Padawan learner. I meant it in the interest of protecting her, Master, of course. We will not go through this exercise again, Anakin. And you will pay attention to my lead. Why? What? Why else do you think we were assigned to her if not to find the killer? Protection is a job for local security, not Jedi. It's overkill, Master. Investigation is implied in our mandate. We will do exactly as the Council has instructed. And you will learn your place, young one. Not only does Obi-Wan criticize his lack of respect, but so does Padme Amidala. What is your suggestion, Master Jedi? Oh, Anakin's not a Jedi yet. He's still a Padawan learner. But I was thinking... Hold on a minute. Excuse me. I was thinking I would stay in the lake country. There's some places up there that are very isolated. Excuse me. I'm in charge of security here, my lady. And this is my home. I know it very well. That is why we're here. I think it would be wise if you took advantage of my knowledge in this instance. Sorry, my lady. All of the people around him feel awkward at his outbursts, and so it's presented as an obvious character flaw. Anakin is rash and arrogant. With Ahsoka, however, her same outbursts and open defiance aren't criticized. Yes, people argue back with her, but she's always able to respond. We were simply searching for Count Dooku. <coughs> yeah, we had the situation well under control, my little Padawan. Oh, I see. So, which part of the situation did you have under control? The blocked entrance, the poison gas, or that Gundark behind you? Gundark? There's still Dooku to deal with. You let him get away? No, not get away, exactly, just... Even if we consider them the same age, Anakin is still being scolded more harshly and being put in his place more often than Ahsoka. Now, one may argue that this is more indicative of the Master than the Apprentice. Maybe Ahsoka's bad behavior is allowed to flourish because Anakin is a bad teacher. That would be a good story element, and it may even be in the back of the writer's mind, yet it's not present in the story. I can say this definitively because the tone of the show takes Ahsoka's side. It is very clear in Attack of the Clones that Anakin is out of line. Even when not openly criticized, the audience can see how rash and destructive his thoughts and actions are. In The Clone Wars, this element is completely missing. In fact, rather than having people hurt, embarrassed, or annoyed by her, the people around her are inspired by her. 
Of course, I'll go over examples in a moment, but first, think how the show treats Ahsoka. I bet you don't view her as being a disrespectful or out-of-line character. Just like you probably don't see Obi-Wan as committing a war crime by disrespecting the sanctity of a ceasefire. The tone wants you to cheer for Obi-Wan here, or even to laugh at how gullible the enemy is. That's because the writers aren't thinking how Obi-Wan's actions would, in real life, cause the Separatists to never again respect peace negotiations. But that's a different topic. All I'm saying is the show wants you to view Ahsoka as a heroic character, rather than an arrogant and disrespectful one. That's the tone that the show is setting, and that's the tone that is observed. The major indication that the show is on her side, excusing her defiant behavior, is in the results of her disobedience. Whenever Ahsoka directly disobeys orders, it always works out in her favor. Whatever mission the main cast sets out to do, they succeed despite or because of Ahsoka's disobedience. Not once in all seven seasons does her straying from the plan make matters worse. No one ever gets hurt because Ahsoka didn't do what she was supposed to do. No one ever dies. No battle is ever lost. No objective is ever failed. I failed. It was a trap, Snips. It wasn't your fault. The closest we get is in the last episode of the series. In it, to escape Order 66, Ahsoka frees Maul as a distraction. Maul destroys the hyperdrive of the ship they're on, causing it to crash. In the crash, Trooper Jesse dies. Thus, because of a choice Ahsoka made, a named character actually dies. Yet this connection isn't made in the show. In fact, the very dubious choice Ahsoka made is hardly even addressed. The only time it is, is in a passing comment made by Rex, where he just says that he's surprised. Did you hear Maul also escaped? He didn't escape. I let him out. What? Why? Diversion. Come on! That's one word for it. Because of Ahsoka, Maul is free to kill nearly every clone on the ship, and yet she's not blamed for that, nor does anyone make that link. Yes. We can see Ahsoka honoring some of the clones with some sort of burial service, yet we don't see if she realizes how she's directly responsible for their deaths, and neither the show nor anyone in it ever condemns her decision. Remember, we must accept the show's logic. Thus, though Ahsoka is without a doubt responsible for Jesse's death for freeing Maul, the show doesn't believe that she is. As such, we can't condemn her either. Just like we can't call Obi-Wan a war criminal despite his actions meriting him such a moniker in real life. Instead, we must call Ahsoka a just warrior, for that's how the episode shows her. She mercifully insists Rex use a stun setting so that he not kill anyone. We continually get these signs of mercy and compassion from someone who just loosed a powerful killer knowing what he could and likely would do. Now go cause some chaos. It's what you're good at. There are too many. Besides, I don't want to hurt them. Thus, though logic condemns her, the show doesn't. As such, according to the show, she's still flawless, and all the problems she faced aren't her fault. Not only is this clear tonal support of Ahsoka, saying that she can do no wrong, it also elevates her to a supreme military strategist. Somehow, this child is the best tactician fielded by the Republic. Other characters can make mistakes, but not Ahsoka. Think again of Anakin in Attack of the Clones. Sometimes his recklessness pays off, such as when he leaps off his speeder and forces Zamosel to crash land. Yet more often, his recklessness needs to immediate problems, such as trying to rush Count Dooku, only to be tossed aside with ease. With Ahsoka, we have payoff after payoff, making her either the luckiest or most brilliant character in all of Star Wars. Well, you won't be coming along on this one. Not coming? But you're breaking into the Citadel. No one's ever done it. The Citadel wasn't designed to hold common criminals. It was created to hold Jedi if any of us lost our way. It's not a place for Padawans. You're just being protective again. That's not fair. How am I supposed to learn if you won't let me share the risk? This isn't a mission for learning. You either do or die. And that's not a risk I'm willing to share. I think he 
he's being overly protective. He's picking and choosing which assignments I can be a part of. He is your master. Yes, but it's not for him to decide when and how I should put my life in danger. That should be it's my choice. Following direct orders isn't always the best way to solve a problem. The Anakin's new teaching method is to do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Welcome aboard. I lied just so I could be a part of the mission. Whether you were meant to be on this mission or not, you are now the most important part of it. Remember this, and see to it that the information I'm about to give you is revealed to no one but the Jedi Council. This, of course, brings in the question of overpowered characters. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with having them, but they have to be done right. We have to believe that they exist in the world they're in. Imagine you're the Republic for a moment. You hear that Commander Tano has some innate strategic ability which has never steered her wrong. She's improved on plans laid out by Anakin and Obi-Wan, two of the best tacticians you have. She can immediately spot flaws in other people's plans and always knows just what to do. Why isn't she promoted? She's like Joan of Arc or something. Give her the whole army. It's like Superman, the classic OP character. But instead of everyone in awe saying, look, up in the sky, no one cares. Now, you could easily come up with reasons why the Republic doesn't promote Ahsoka. She is, after all, a child. But if I were Anakin and I saw that every time Ahsoka disobeyed me, she either made matters no worse or improved them, I'd stop giving her orders. Instead, I'd ask her to double-check my strategies. And even if Anakin is too proud to acknowledge Ahsoka's superiority, why doesn't Obi-Wan or any other Jedi? Why not any of the clones? Obi-Wan especially, as he has more authority over Anakin, could pull him aside and suggest he trust Ahsoka with more responsibility. But Ahsoka's amazing abilities only start with her incredible luck. Her true OP status comes from her being the most powerful Jedi in the franchise, and again, with no one in the story acknowledging this. Look at her record. We'll start off simple. First, let's look at Order 66. Few Jedi survived Order 66, and those who did were either lucky, extremely powerful, or had circumstances just so happened to work out in their favor. After all, Order 66 was specifically designed to kill all Jedi. Obviously, there's a huge amount of variance, but Ahsoka's ordeal was rather cut and dry. She's surrounded by dozens of clones, and yet lives. Later, hundreds of clones attack her from every side, and she only sustains slight injuries. She sensed something was wrong before Obi-Wan did. Yet let's compare her to Kiati Mundi and Ayla Secura, who met Order 66 similarly, being surrounded, ambushed, and gunned down. These skilled Jedi lasted mere seconds. If they were central characters, probably more time would have been devoted to their deaths. Yet still, they didn't sense anything in time, and they didn't survive. Ahsoka, while trapped on a ship, did. Yes, Maul helped divert attention during the middle of Ahsoka's escape, but at the beginning, she was surrounded by dozens, and at the end, she was surrounded by hundreds. Had she been Kiari Mundi or Ayla Secura, she'd be dead. But I'll admit, Order 66 isn't the strongest argument. There's just too many variables. So, let's see how she does against Asajj Ventress. Now, Ahsoka doesn't win. In fact, she's clearly outmatched by Ventress. But keep in mind, Ventress is an assassin who kills Jedi. In fact, she's purported to be quite good at it. How good? Well, we see in Tartakovsky's Clone Wars that Anakin is hard-pressed to beat her. At this time, Anakin is 19 or 20, so not yet at his prime, but still older than Ahsoka and the Chosen One. Ventress also proves herself by besting Luminara Unduli, one of the most powerful Jedi at that time. What's more, she puts up a good fight against Obi-Wan, who is even more powerful than Unduli. 
Exactly how powerful Obi-Wan is isn't ever clearly stated, although the only Jedi who are definitively more powerful than him are Mace Windu and Yoda. Everyone else is debatable. So Ventress can contend with potentially the third best Jedi in the galaxy. Even if Obi-Wan isn't third best, he's certainly in the top ten, which makes Ventress easily one of the most powerful beings in the galaxy. Thus we have a trained assassin who's killed full-grown Jedi and can contend with the most powerful Jedi of her day, and yet struggles with Ahsoka. Yes, I know Ventress is clearly superior in her fight with Ahsoka, but Ahsoka survives. How is this not a bloodbath? Ahsoka's an inexperienced teenager who hasn't finished her training, and she's fighting an assassin who can and has killed some of the best Jedi the galaxy has to offer. If you're unimpressed, know that that's just the beginning. Next, let's consider how she does against General Grievous. Here is someone who isn't just said, but is shown to repeatedly kill Jedi. Obi-Wan struggled to best General Grievous. Again, the list of people more powerful than Obi-Wan is a very short list. Yet, Grievous gave him a run for his money, forcing him to resort to uncivilized means of combat. Again, Ahsoka doesn't beat Grievous, but she does land a few blows and gets away no worse for wear. And remember, this is a teenage Ahsoka while Obi-Wan is in his prime in terms of lightsaber combat. Look at Grievous's introduction in Tartakovsky's Clone Wars. In it, he fights Kyadi Mundi, Shakti, Ayla Sakura, Kukruk, Tarsier, and Shagi. For context, Tarsier and Shagi are Ahsoka's near contemporaries, all three being Padawan learners about the same time. These two are fairly useless, especially Shagi who dies instantly. It would be no surprise then that Ahsoka would do similarly. Having her more powerful than either of them, however, isn't so surprising either. But how much more powerful? Kukruk and Ayla Secura are prominent knights of respectable power. Not among the best, but good enough to be noted. As for Kiadi Mundi and Shakti, they are among the best. They are members of the Jedi High Council and are noted for their considerable power. Now, to be fair, the six Jedi are tired after a long battle, before they engage Grievous, so they're not at their best. But what happens in the fight? Grievous annihilates them. It's not even close. True, they land a couple blows, but Grievous is mostly unfazed while dealing lethal and near-lethal strikes to all six of his opponents. Those who escape do so barely, and only because reinforcements chase Grievous away. Yet Ahsoka escapes on her own and in much better health. In short, Ahsoka, by herself, does better against Grievous than six Jedi combined. Yes, they're tired, but there's six of them, and two of them are among the most powerful Jedi in the galaxy. For Ahsoka, as a teenager, to be as powerful as Ayla Secura is as an adult is impressive. It's not so impressive that it's strange, but it is impressive. But Ahsoka did better than two knights, and two masters. If the fact that they are tired is bothering you, forget the Padawans and the knights. It's not a precise scale, but maybe the two masters fully rested are as good as the six Jedi tired? That's still two Jedi masters that Ahsoka is better than, and not just any Jedi masters, but two of the most powerful masters. If that's still not enough for you, just look at Shakti. She fights Grievous by herself and is captured. Shakti is a full-grown Jedi master and prominent general in the Clone Wars, is outdone by a teenager. Forgetting Shakti and Grievous's solo fight, perhaps you say this isn't a fair comparison as Grievous is uniquely equipped to fight multiple opponents. Though this is true, the argument works both ways. While Kiadi Mundi could rely on Shakti to distract one or two of Grievous's lightsabers, Ahsoka, by herself, had to face all four. Grievous can, effectively, outnumber Ahsoka and overwhelm her, blocking and striking simultaneously as he did against Obi-Wan. Grievous has such overwhelming power that it should be no surprise if he killed Ahsoka as quickly as he did Shagi. That would be normal. If she lasted as long as Tarsair, that'd be impressive. Yet she lasted longer than Kukruk, 
longer than Ayla Secura, longer than Kiati Moody, and longer than Shock T. That's not impressive anymore. That's insane. Still unimpressed? I saved the best for last. In Season 7, we see Ahsoka face off against Maul. The fight is fairly even, going back and forth a few times, yet Ahsoka ends up with a victory. This, at the very least, puts her on par with a 20-year-old Obi-Wan from The Phantom Menace, who also barely managed a victory over Maul. Yet comparing her only to this young Obi-Wan is unfair, as Maul had just had a fight with Qui-Gon and was doubtlessly fatigued. He even took a few hits and had to fight two Jedi at once. When he fought Ahsoka, he was fresh. What's more, Maul has a few rematches against Obi-Wan when the Jedi is battle-hardened by the Clone Wars. This more experienced and more powerful version of Obi-Wan still struggles to escape Maul with his life. He wins, but only just. This quite clearly puts Ahsoka, age 17, as an equal to Obi-Wan in his prime. Not to mention making her more powerful in combat than Qui-Gon, one of the most powerful Jedi of his age. True, Qui-Gon's power wasn't combat-focused, but he, a student of Count Dooku, was still noted for his dueling skill. Now, I've watched enough Jedi comparison videos to know that many will protest my use of the simple if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C argument. Those who do will say that situations and lightsaber style play far too major factors to allow this simplistic argument to hold much weight. And although this is partly true, it's also partly not. I'm a fencer who competes on a national level, so I've had my fair share of sword fights. In USA fencing, we have a letter rating system from A to E, where A's are the highest rated slash best fencers. I'm a level B fencer. My style of fencing is particularly weak to hyper-aggressive styles. I like to use distance and timing, so if someone rushes me, though I may block an attack here or there, they will eventually break through my defenses. I know then that if I fence another B fencer who has an aggressive style, I'm probably going to lose, even if he lost to someone I typically beat. If I fence a C-level fencer with an aggressive style, I'll probably win, but I wouldn't be surprised if I lost. However, if I fence a D-level aggressive fencer, I'm not worried. I'll win without a problem. The thing is, there's such a gap of skill between a D and a B that all the aggression in the world can't make up the difference. In fact, I recently faced such a fencer, and I won the bout 15-3 to 3 before the end of the first period. Each period is three minutes long, so I hit him faster than five times per minute. In a duel with lightsabers, where one hit is fatal, the fight would have lasted about as long as Grievous vs. Shaggy. This isn't me bragging. This is me saying that stylistic advantages only go so far. If fighters are close in skill, then look to style. But style's never going to save you if you're just outmatched. Skill is so much more important than style. If, then, style is a factor, then the skills of the combatants must be comparable. Thus, to even bring style up is to say Maul, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka are all peers. Look at kickboxing. These are all professional fighters who've devoted their life to training and being the best. Style, therefore, makes a difference at times. But get Conor McGregor and put him against a middle school or high school prodigy, and you won't see style anymore. He'll just hit the guy. If there's a large gap in skill, I just don't care about style. As for situations, yes, these are important. Unfortunately, we have no sure way to calculate how important because people respond to situations differently. All we can do is look to consistency. If, for example, another fencer beats me, it may be because I'm having a bad day. Maybe he's having a good day. Maybe I'm sick or injured. Who knows? Yet, if he beats me on two different days, then it's less likely to be situational. If he beats me every time I fence him, then maybe he's just better than me. And what have we seen from Ahsoka? She consistently contends with people powerful enough to beat the best. 
Ventress, Grievous, and Maul all can best members of the High Council and have given Obi-Wan a hard time. Thus, Ahsoka shows she can be counted right along with Anakin, Obi-Wan, Shakti, and Qui-Gon as one of the most powerful Jedi of her time. And again, this is considering she's as good as, or better than them, while between the ages of 14 and 17. Now we can consider a style and say maybe she beat Maul while losing to General Grievous because Grievous' multi-armed style was simply too much for her. That, I believe, but first we have to say she's on par with the best of the best. Allow me to repeat that there's nothing wrong with OP characters. There is something wrong with having them and not acknowledging them. Again, it's like having Superman flying around and no one remarking that that's not normal. Yes, Ahsoka's said to be skilled, a promising student and all that, but that's not doing her achievements justice. She's as good as Obi-Wan while half his age. That's crazy. That's not something to note in passing. To put it another way, if I introduced to you a teenager and told you she's the top of her class a bright student with a lot of potential, and then you found out that she's as smart as Stephen Hawking, wouldn't you say I undersold her abilities? Wouldn't you question why no one's talking about this child's super genius? I mean, she's on par with the chosen one. Shouldn't that merit more of a reaction than just a passing comment? Yet, yeah, while people note Anakin's impressive abilities and quick learning, no one says much about Ahsoka, who does more at a younger age. Again, Obi-Wan is nearly 20 years older than Ahsoka, and they're both able to edge out Darth Maul in a duel. If Ahsoka is on par with Obi-Wan when 20 years younger, imagine how powerful she'll be when she's older. To be as good as Ahsoka is should astound everyone. Sidious should be intrigued. Jedi should question if perhaps she's the chosen one. Maybe Anakin should even be jealous. Yet, of course, no one seems to take notice, treating her extreme power merely as basic talent. That makes the viewer not believe what he or she is seeing because none of the characters treat what's happening as real. No reaction brings the significance of her actions into question. There's a divide between her and the world she's in, making her not seem as though she belongs in her own story. And that's bad writing. There needs to be a reason why. How is she so powerful, and why does no one care that she is? Of course, one can have a mystery. I'll never force a story to give an answer for everything. Perhaps no one will ever figure out why she's so powerful. Well, we'll come back to that idea, but at the very least, they should address it. That way we can see she's actually impacting the world she's in. A character who doesn't impact her world, despite all she does, is a pointless character. So, Ahsoka is the luckiest character, having every decision go her way, and when things don't go perfectly, she has the unbelievable skill to get away with her life, no worse for wear. Are these character traits, or is this plot armor? Since no one in the story reacts to what's happening, it's quite clearly plot armor. In fact, it is some ridiculously strong plot armor. Now, Star Wars is known for its plot armor, Stormtroopers have amazing aim until they aim at main characters and so forth. But Ahsoka's level of plot armor puts everyone else's to shame. Not only does this make Ahsoka's character unbelievable and thus uninteresting, it also eliminates any reason to sympathize with her plight. I never have to worry if things are going to work out because I know they will. She won't die. She won't get hurt. She was shot during Order 66 several times and was perfectly okay. She always wins the day, or at the very least, gets away with her life and the moral high ground. I can't celebrate her overcoming obstacles because none of her enemies seem like obstacles. When she fights Cad Bane, she struggles and then wins. When she fights Darth Maul, she struggles and then wins. So is Cad Bane as formidable as Darth Maul? Please. And I know she was younger when she fought Cad Bane, but there should be a huge power gap between Cad Bane and Darth Maul. Yet there's no drama in these fights, because Ahsoka will always be as strong as the plot needs her to be. 
Thus, even when she technically loses a fight, there are still no stakes because her loss doesn't change her status nor negatively impact the Republic. Compare her defeats to Cain and Jairus' defeats. When Kanan is defeated, the main cast needs a moment to recoup and figure out how to recover or even survive. When Ahsoka is defeated, we move on to the next fight where everyone's immediately fresh and confident in their abilities. Absolutely no negative impact. Perhaps you will point to Ahsoka's exile from the Jedi Order as evidence against me. Here was a clear defeat she suffered, which clearly impacted her story and the story of those around her. This, however, can't be called her defeat, but rather the Jedi's defeat. They failed her, she didn't fail them. Then, she exiled herself, they didn't exile her. She's in control, she is morally superior. She proves her own innocence, and then strikes out into the world to find success after success. Again, her sorrow and confusion is because someone else failed. Even when imprisoned, she finds escape easy, doing it even while hiding her Force abilities. Alternatively, when Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Count Dooku are imprisoned by another crime syndicate, they struggle to escape. True, the situations are very different, but my point is that no matter how hard things get for Ahsoka, she's always strong enough to overcome. In a zero-stakes game, how can I be invested? Think about Luke. He gets to say and do pretty much whatever he wants and have it work out for him. He even goes so far as to belittle the Death Star itself and not have his arrogance thrown back in his face. That's impossible, even for a computer. It's not impossible. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. They're not much bigger than two meters. Then man your ships, and may the Force be with you. If anyone has plot armor, it's him. And yet, as we know, he is rarely able to walk out of a fight as confidently as Ahsoka can. On a more personal note, I don't really like the rebellious teen character trope Ahsoka originally falls under. She, a newly appointed Padawan, a teenager, is thrust into a war and she immediately believes she knows better than those around her, and regularly defies orders. The young character who defies authority and proves them wrong is an age-old trope. Remember, be mindful, and speak only when spoken to. Don't I always? Now, tropes aren't necessarily bad, but I am tired of this one. Not only is it overdone, but it's a bit hard to believe to begin with. I know authority isn't always right. Sometimes governments are corrupt. Sometimes militaries are misguided. But what about teenagers? Could it be that perhaps, maybe, a teenager doesn't know better than thousands of years of military history? I know no one is stupid enough to join the military and then defy command because they watched the Clone Wars, but I hate how often the message is repeated that those in command don't know what they're doing. More often than not, they don't, yet neither does anyone else. Yes, the American Revolution threw off corruption and created a prosperous nation, but then there's the French Revolution which created the Reign of Terror. Sometimes defying command, even corrupt command, results in a worse situation. After all, the chain of command exists for a reason. Defiance isn't always a good thing, and kids don't always know better than the adults. This rebellious teen then evolves into a holier-than-thou character who talks down to anyone who doesn't live up to her moral standard. Again, such character tropes aren't necessarily bad, but when it comes from someone who hasn't earned my respect, it makes me like them all the less. I mean, look how she talks to Obi-Wan. No, it's Coruscant. Grievous has attacked the capital. What about the Chancellor? Shock T has been sent to protect him, but Master Windu has lost contact with her. Not to worry. Our fleet can be there within the hour. So that's it? You're going to abandon Bo-Katan and her people? Ahsoka, surely you understand. This is a pivotal moment in the Clone Wars. The heart of the Republic is under attack. I understand that, as usual, you're playing politics. This is why the people have lost faith in the Jedi. I had too, until I was reminded of what the Order means to people who truly need us. Right now, people on Coruscant need us. No. 
The Chancellor needs you. That's not fair. I'm not trying to be. The self-righteousness in her tone is palpable. Even if she's right, which I don't believe she is, can't she have a little understanding and see where Obi-Wan is coming from? She has no respect for him at all. But I've complained enough. Let's get on with solutions. Ahsoka's character can be compelling if a few changes are made. They needn't be drastic changes. The changes I'm proposing will keep Ahsoka very recognizable. The first proposed fix is, I think, obvious. Make her mess up. There are two ways this could go. First, the Kanan Jarrus route. Kanan loses most of the fights he's in, but that's fine. I don't know anyone who looks down on him for doing so. We understand his training was incomplete. In the same way, having Ahsoka lose more doesn't make her appear weak. We understand she has limitations. Why wouldn't she? She's a child. In fact, not having limitations is harder to understand than having them. As I said before, Ahsoka doesn't always win, but she never loses. Her defeats are never damaging, and that's not the case with Kanan. Most obviously, he is blinded when he fights Maul, but more subtly, he is emotionally tormented and made to question his abilities and his cause during his fights with the Grand Inquisitor. He's faced with the seeming futility of his fight by being underprepared. Ahsoka is always able to rise to the occasion, so she never faces this same urgency. This new version of Ahsoka needn't be blinded or maimed in any other way, but if she faces crushing and humiliating defeat, then we'll see how she reacts. In her reaction, we'll see who she is as a person. When everything goes bad for Ahsoka and she leaves the Order, it's by her own choice. And though she doesn't know what to do with her life right away, she is immediately presented with cause after cause, first with the two sisters and then with the Mandalorians. She has an immediate and obvious noble path to follow and no real reason to question it. She has a few throwaway lines about not knowing what to do, but when presented with the opportunity, she hardly hesitates to rejoin the war she just left. Then, in the following episode, she righteously condemns Obi-Wan for being too political. Though Obi-Wan's choice is clearly valid, the show sides with Ahsoka, allowing her to immediately get on her high horse without ever really falling off it. Kanan, however, spends episode after episode doubting he can be of any use. He resists joining the Rebel Alliance and, after being blinded, sidelines himself for a long time. We can see his struggle and how he eventually overcomes it. It is, therefore, inspiring when he does, because we know it was a struggle. We don't see Ahsoka's struggle, so we can't celebrate any triumph. When Kanan eventually defeats the Grand Inquisitor, it means something drastic, because we saw him lose every other time. We now know something's changed, and that Kanan's improved himself. With Ahsoka, there's a flat line of achievement. No ups, no downs. She wins or escapes unscathed. I think the Kanan method is particularly fitting, as Star Wars has always been an underdog story. But maybe we want something more unique. Thus, I present the Hera Syndulla fix. Hera Syndulla happens to be my favorite Dave Filoni character, so I'd be in favor of this particular fix. Unlike Kanan, Hera overcomes all the time. She's an underdog in the sense that she's undersupplied, but Hera's never outmatched as a pilot, and is never without a plan. While Kanan faces defeat after defeat, Hera only faces victories. This makes her more like Ahsoka already, yet Hera's character is distinct from Ahsoka in two ways. First, her abilities are explained, defined, and noted by the other characters, and second, she faces failure. Hera demonstrates herself better than the typical Imperial pilot, and we repeatedly hear multiple characters praising her skills. Of course, outflying these isn't so impressive, so we see her outfly the best pilot the Empire has. She struggles to do this, so we know the stakes are higher. Then, her skills are noted and complimented by Thrawn. She even flies against Darth Vader at one point. She realizes he's too good and so manages to escape. 
In this way, we see consistency. We know how good a pilot Hera is. She's better than the best non-Force user, but obviously can't compete with the Chosen One. With Ahsoka, there's no consistency, struggling with Cad Bane as much as with Darth Maul. Consistency clearly defines Hera's abilities, making her more real, while the continual praise of the other characters reinforces how good she is. Thrawn readjusts his strategies to make up for her abilities. That's great interplay between the character and the world. And losing to Darth Vader isn't a detriment to her abilities. In fact, it's impressive that she's able to escape him at all. She doesn't have the Force, and he's the best pilot in the Star Wars universe. These in-world limitations don't stop her from being the best non-Force-sensitive pilot, nor being generally amazing. With Ahsoka, however, she's not just the best Padawan. She, as a teenager, is on par with the best Jedi ever to live. That's unprecedented power, and it is left without explanation or comment. It's okay not to be perfect. Then, perhaps one of the best moments from Star Wars Rebels, Hera makes a mistake in Season 4 when trying to break through Thrawn's blockade. Up to this point, her mistakes have been similar to Ahsoka in that, though she loses, she faces no lasting consequences. Here, however, her entire fleet is shot down. True, only nameless characters die, but it's an obvious blow that impacts the entire storyline, eventually resulting in Kanan's death. I'm not blaming Hera for Kanan's death, of course, but am emphasizing how a bad choice Hera made changed everything. This shows that her decisions carry weight. At any time, everything can come literally crashing down around her. The stakes are high. As a result, when Hera hesitates to act, we know why. The most comparable loss Ahsoka suffers is the loss of the clones during Order 66. This, however, was due to Sidious and Maul, not Ahsoka herself. Of course, this is using the show's logic, which doesn't blame Ahsoka for freeing Maul. Hera is directly responsible for the failed attack, while Ahsoka is a victim of Sidious's scheme. Hera, as a result, learns an important lesson about herself, while Ahsoka does not. To fix this, we simply need to have Ahsoka mess up. Perhaps, defying an order, she gets her squad killed and reinforcements are needed to cover her retreat. Now we can see that this war is serious. It's not just kids playing around doing whatever they want. Thrawn is highly regarded as one of the better villains, and part of this is due to him having significant success. Give Ahsoka's villains some successes. Then we'll know they're tough to beat and be impressed when Ahsoka beats them. Showing that lives are on the line make the choices meaningful. Ahsoka, the sheltered and young Jedi, must grow up fast and face the harsh reality that she doesn't know everything and that not everything will work out in the end. She'll have to be responsible. She'll have to respect those who are responsible. Imagine if her actions led to Rex dying. I'm not saying that that should be done, but imagine how that would impact her. How would she overcome such a blow? Would it make her stronger, or would it break her? We see something similar with Hera. Kanan's death crippled Hera for a time, but eventually she recovered and we could admire her for it. Yet the Hera fix, although allowing Ahsoka some remnant of her OP status, still decreases her power. If you want to keep her ridiculously and inexplicably overpowered, I have a fix for that as well. This I'm calling the Bendu fix. Bendu is inexplicably OP, but I'm not bothered by that fact. Why? Well, because everyone's amazed and perplexed by him. People just accept them because they have to, but they can never fully wrap their head around him. If Ahsoka is going to be as lucky and as skilled as she is in the show, then let the characters around her be in awe. Let them question how it could be. What's Sidious's take on Ahsoka? This apprentice has survived assassins, Jedi killers, and Sith. She's a new power piece on the board he has to consider. Perhaps he will try to manipulate her or something. There's a Legends character named Zane Carrick who has a strange connection with the Force, which could appear as luck. Perhaps Ahsoka has the same connection. Perhaps the Force is washing out for her because she's the key to some great movement in the Force. Whatever the reason... Have it be part of the world she's in, rather than her divorced from the reality of her own universe. 
if this fix is taken, the mystery of Ahsoka's power mustn't dead end. This is different from Bendu, as his mystery is never solved. It's okay with Bendu, because he's not central to the plot. Not so with Ahsoka. She's central, so we're invested in her character arc. If that arc is never completed, we'll have a sense that the story's incomplete. Now, to address the deconstructivists, absurdists, and nihilists out there, that completion can be nothingness. Perhaps Ahsoka dies and no one ever finds out why she was so significant. That's fine, so long as the characters note this infuriating emptiness to the mystery. A non-resolution is still a resolution, but to ignore the mystery isn't clever storytelling. It's bad writing. One may argue that life isn't so neat as to have an answer to every riddle, yet this isn't a proper argument. If I say, I want to tell you something, you will expect me to then tell you something. If I don't, you'll be rightly frustrated. The Clone Wars TV show is presenting a topic with every character and storyline. If it never follows through with them, then it never finishes saying what it started. Now, I can say, I forgot, or never mind as a type of non-resolution, but if I simply stop talking after grabbing your attention, you'll be justly annoyed. Even non-resolutions like I forgot and never mind still show that there is an end to what has started. Now you can see that not every narrative has a satisfying end, as hearing never mind can be very unsatisfying. In this way, we have our deconstructivist ending. If, however, I grab your attention to then remain perfectly silent, you may begin to wonder if I'm right in the head. Here, we have no ending, only confusion. Imagine, for example, if Ahsoka just vanishes from the show and no one ever mentions her again. That's not some clever, introspective form of storytelling. That's a plot hole. Now, of course, the reason she has this inexplicable power isn't an in-universe reason. It's plot armor. She's meant to pander to a younger audience, and how can the pandering character be anything but perfect? They want children to identify with Ahsoka, so she always wins, so they can imagine always winning. Yet this is a cheap way to make a character. Give a character arcs and trials so that viewers who identify with her can challenge themselves. Will I overcome like Kanan? Will I heal like Hera? I can't be like Ahsoka, because no giant corporation is eager to profit off my well-being. There's metafiction potential here, but the show doesn't go that route either. She's meant to be taken at face value, but I can't because there's no part of her character to grab onto. Ahsoka's character is almost fixed in Rebels. However, this is due simply to her flaws not carrying over into this show rather than any retroactive fixes. First, her skills seem about on par with the end of Season 7 of The Clone Wars. In fact, you may be able to argue she's weaker in this show. Her feats include defeating some Inquisitors, briefly going even with Maul, and holding her own against Darth Vader. Obviously, these are still very impressive. True, the Inquisitors aren't on the same level as Asajj Ventress, but do keep in mind that they hunt and kill Jedi for a living. Yes, they use vast resources and numbers where Asajj Ventress used pure skill, but besting two Inquisitors at once is still impressive. As for Maul, he's well past his physical prime now while Ahsoka, being 31, is in hers. Considering she beat him when he was in his prime and she wasn't, I would expect her to have an easier time. Even still, Maul is one of the most powerful beings of his era, thus keeping up with him even in his old age is impressive. And with Darth Vader, they show Ahsoka is clearly hard-pressed to keep up with him, yet this is Darth Vader. The list of people who dueled Vader and lived is very short. So, as I said, they seem to have toned down Ahsoka's OP status. But better still, there's more rationale behind that status in Rebels. As said before, she's 31 now, in her physical prime. That throws all the arguments of her being a child out the window. Obi-Wan is in his late 30s during the Clone Wars, so much more comparable to Ahsoka in Rebels. For someone with Obi-Wan's age and experience to match his accomplishments is still impressive, Remember, he's one of the best Jedi of his time, but it's not unreasonable. For an Ahsoka in her prime to beat Maul, contend with Ventress, Grievous, etc., will put her somewhere in the top ten most powerful Jedi of her time. That's amazing, but believable. 
for her to do all these things well before her prime is beyond amazing. So upping her age, but not her abilities, really helps the believability. Now, of course, Ahsoka hasn't had formal training since being a teenager, similarly to Kanan. But I can forgive all of this, because I don't know what happened between the end of the Clone Wars and the start of Rebels. Maybe she's had some secret training we just don't know about. The other problem, which didn't cross over, was recognition. All the characters Ahsoka encounters realize that she is extremely powerful. This is good. She feels real, because she does awesome things and people are amazed. If this was the only Ahsoka I knew, I'd be fine with her character. I may even like her. Unfortunately, this improved version still doesn't correct the bad version presented in the Clone Wars. There's simply two Ahsokas, one which makes sense and one which doesn't. I'd like to say again that I'm not trying to turn people against Ahsoka. If you like Ahsoka, good for you. I'm simply trying to explain why I don't like her. She's a poorly written character. It's fine to like her, but if you want to tell me she's well written, I'm going to need some evidence. A lot of people I talk to who like Ahsoka cite her character arc as why they like her. She goes from naively trusting the Jedi Order to thinking more critically. This is a fine arc indeed, but having an arc is the minimum of what a character should have. I want something a bit more to justify her status as one of the most popular Star Wars characters across all movies, shows, books, games, and comics. And where are all the Hera Syndulla fans? I'd watch a show about her over Ahsoka any day of the week. But that's all from me. Thanks for watching.